It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with financial advisors Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. Wisdom, blending intellect and application. That's what we're about here. All right. My name is Mike Bernard. I am your host. I'm also one of the certified financial planners on the show. With me, my business partners and fellow CFPs over at Corhorn Financial Group, Josh Gregory and Kevin Corhorn. The health savings account, also known as the HSA, is an extremely versatile financial instrument. So to make the most of it, should you transfer your IRA into your HSA? It's an interesting question with an interesting answer, and we'll let you know what you should do or shouldn't do on today's episode. And following up, following up on last week's episode, we're actually going to be uh, taking a question here from Linda about when you should pre-plan your funeral. And we've got some other great questions as well that we're going to be hitting in the second half of the program. If you have a question for us, we'd love to hear from you, whether you have a need or whether you'd like to have a question aired over the over the show. Reach out to us. You can find us online, wisemoneyradio.com. Submit a question right there on the right. You can call or text us, 574 222-2000. That's 574-222-2000. And then lastly, all over social media, wherever you're at, where there are two, just search The Wise Money Show and you can submit questions there as well. Whether that's on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, submit questions right there. We'll get back to you and we'll air them right here on the on the program. So, all right. Once a week, you guys know that Corhorn Financial Group is a team of financial professionals that all collaborate together to figure out what are the best solutions for the people that we get to serve for this community. That's the big idea. Financial professionals collaborating together on the benefit of the folks that we serve. And so one of the ways that we do that is something that Josh um, it likes to call case class. I'm just kidding. We call it case <laughs> class internally. Josh always tries to rename everything. He's tried to rename the show 14 times, actually. Oh uh, so I don't know. What, what, what do we call it? Um, we call it case class internally, but... We've also thought of it as an advisory forum. Oh, that's this that's is stealing fun. an analogy out of the medical f- uh, field, and, and it's something that actually I, I got to experience with Andrea when she was going through her uh, cancer bout. All these professionals coming together to give advice and perspective on her situation, and we got to be in the room actually. Right. Yeah, I think to be fair, Joshua, and when Joshua says we've thought of it as an advisory <laughs> forum, the answer is Joshua's thought of it as an advisory forum. The rest of us have thought of it as case class, but it is it, the big idea is that we are collaborating to figure out what. In, and and there's really a competition for what are the best ideas and best potential solutions because there's always more than one way to um, – we used to say on the farm, we used to say skin a cat. but it, That's not politically correct, I'm sure. Probably not. It doesn't – sorry to tell it's, you cats it out It is there. a pretty nerdy competition too because yeah. uh, you've got a bunch of very technically minded folks who want to help the client and they're all throwing out ideas and – and I tell you, the, the tax code especially has some pretty obscure corners where you can find some goodies. And uh, we've got a, a team of professionals that loves to go find them. Right? Yeah. Well, I, certainly what we're talking about today um, makes the word obscure seem mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> so once a week, we pack a bunch of insurance advisors, CPAs, financial planners, uh, CFPs all in a room. And we analyze a case or two together and come up with ideas. And yeah, the, the discussions are always nerdy, but... Sometimes they're pretty lively as well. And, well, they're always pretty lively as we're kind of challenging each other and trying to find the best ideas, the best strategy. And a a few weeks ago, during that time, we started talking about this very topic, which is could you or should you transfer some of your IRA to an HSA? And I immediately went over to my wise money notes and put, okay, topic for the show. We need to be (laughs) talking about that because it is quite obscure and – then that begs the question, well, how do you do it and should you do it? So we're going to get into that. But before we do, let's level the playing field. What in the world is an HSA? Who can start it? How do you get money in? What are the tax benefits? How do you, how do you use it? All that. So, so the basics of the HSA. So basics of the HSA, and it is a little bit confusing, 
to an HSA is an account that you can put money into. And when you put money into that account, the money, the amount of money that goes into the account, you do not pay taxes on that. So in a year in which you have income and you have a high deductible health plan. So because it's somewhat confusing because a lot of times uh, we'll, we'll be talking with clients and they'll say, yeah, I have an HSA at work. Well, actually, you have a high deductible health plan at work, which makes you HSA eligible. That's right. You're well, elig- to, to make it even more confusing, not every high deductible plan is HSA eligible, right? So if you have a plan at work that you can, you can ask your HR uh, manager or someone in the in the the payroll area, they could be able to tell you, do you have an HSA eligible plan? But these rules, uh, they're they're very specific on whether or not your plan at work or one that maybe you purchased individually out in the marketplace is eligible for an HSA, a health savings account. This special account that Kevin's referring to that you can set money aside into um, before taxes, and as long as it sits in that account and earns interest or even grows with the, the market, um, it's not being taxed along the way. And then when you pull the money back out and use it for medical expenses, it comes out tax-free there as well. So in the taxes we're talking about that you would be avoiding, when you contribute um, out of your checking account, you just write a check and put it into your HSA, that's a deduction on the front page of your tax return, so it saves you federal and state taxes. Our favorite way, though, for you to get money into that HSA plan is to contribute right out of your paycheck. And when you do that, you're avoiding um, that income doesn't show up on line seven of your tax return, which is your wages. And and so it avoids federal and state taxes. But by doing it out of your paycheck, it avoids FICA taxes as well, which is which, you know, you need to be mindful of. Then that means that income isn't counting towards your Social Security, but it's such a small amount usually the tax savings is more beneficial there. That's right. So, okay, so then when you pull the money out for qualified medical expenses, it comes out tax-free. This is the only thing I know in the tax laws where it's pre-tax in, tax-free out. Exactly. To, to get a tax write-off on the front end and a tax benefit when you're removing money from the account, both places – that makes it unusual. That's what makes it better even than a Roth IRA that we talk so highly of. Um, but again, it, it's intended to be used for uh, medical expenses during your working career, but you don't have to pull the money out by the end of the year. Like maybe you're familiar with a flexible spending account. You know, that that's the old use it or lose it type of plan. But the HSA doesn't have that feature. You could leave the money in this health savings account uh, it really indefinitely, yep. right? Yep. Okay, so now let's start getting to the question, but I'm going to ask a question before the question. Before we talk about should you, we need to talk about can you. Can you transfer some of your IRA to your HSA? Uh, the, the short answer is yes, you can. We wouldn't be bringing it up, I guess, if... Uh, Show's over. Yep. No, nope, you can't <laughs> you do can't. it. Thanks. <laughs> what a bizarre question. Like, who yeah. would even think of that? But the, but, the, but the question is, why would I want to do that? And why would I even want to keep listening to such a bizarre thing? And here's the reason why. is because I can take pre-tax money in, in my IRA that I've never paid taxes on, move it to my HSA, pull it out of my HSA tax-free to cover medical expenses. So in essence... I'm playing this cosmic shell game to get money that should be taxable to be tax-free. Which is a wonderful deal, right? Yeah. Because that's what allows you, you – you got an upfront uh, tax write-off when you put money into that traditional IRA, and now you can get it back out tax-free if you do this maneuver of shifting some money from the IRA to the Roth IRA. But there's always a catch, mm-hmm. right? And I, I think we'll be unpacking that in uh, in our next segment. Well, there's kind of a couple. There's a couple traps that anytime I, we're talking about tax planning, and there's um, you, you need to wear you know handle it with white gloves and really be careful. I call them tax traps because the the warning signs aren't really clear, and you can easily kind of walk your way into 
into, into a trap there. So we're going to help you avoid it. But then also, okay, if you can do it, and we've talked to you about the traps to avoid, should you do it? There, I, I think there's a couple times when you would. There's a couple times when you wouldn't. We're going to lay both of those out. That and more coming up here on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. All right. Thanks for listening today, YouTube. This is the Wise Money Show. If you're not already a subscriber, I'd encourage you to do that. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell button as well so that you're up to date. You're notified of all future content that we're pushing out here. We've got one show for the Wise Money Show. That's It's a radio show. It airs locally uh, on station 95.3 FM in the South Bend area. And then we record that in every episode. Then just post right here on this channel once a week. We also have different videos that come out each and every week, some on, on uh, Facebook only, some right here on this channel. So um, leave comments below, smash that thumbs up button if you like it, share it if someone else you, you know needs to hear this message. Okay, so we didn't talk about the rules mm -hmm. with, with this because um, if, we didn't, if we hadn't run out of time, I'd have said, oh, you can do this and you can take it out tax-free? All right, I'll do my whole IRA. Right. So that, do I get a deduction when I transfer it? I mean, of course, of, people are going to think that, mm. right? And I, I think that's fairly logical question. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just do that every year. No, you can't do that either. Right. So, so those three traps, if you will, will hit. Okay. Cool? Yep. All right. So, and then we'll get into situations when you would, situations when you wouldn't. One thing we didn't talk about was limits. Right. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought that's what you were just No, we didn't to. talk about uh, HSA basics. How much can oh. you put in the HSA? Well, year? when we talk about the rule for this transfer, Perfect. we can hit that then. You're so smart. All right. So I haven't told. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to Josh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ready? Can you transfer money from your IRA into your HSA? The answer is yes, but there's some traps you need to watch out for. We're going to hit those here in just a second. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being with us. My name is Mike Bernard. Here with me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Thank you to the attorneys at South Bank Legal as well as First State Bank for making the Wise Money Show possible. Been faithful supporters of the show since it started five years ago. We appreciate your support. Check them out if you have needs. Uh, if you're looking for Wise Money content, more Wise Money content, you can find it online, wisemoneyradio.com, and then wherever you're at in social media, we're there too. Just search the Wise Money Show. Subscribe to it at your favorite social media uh, venue. All right. We, we, we asked the question, should you transfer some of your IRA to your HSA? But we've started with, well, well, can you? Yes, you can, but there are some traps. And the first trap is you can only transfer up to the contribution limit for that year. So when, when Josh said uh, earlier that, well, yeah, you could transfer pre-tax money to your HSA and pull it out tax-free, I thought, sign me up. I'll do my whole IRA. It's already in a Roth, by the way, but um, but I'll do my whole IRA. No, you can only transfer up to the contribution limit. Yeah, this is what you know. Obviously, limits the goodness of this whole this whole rule. But uh, when you have an HSA eligible plan and you decide to open up your own health savings account, could be at your local bank or credit union. It could even be an investment related HSA you're limited on how much money you can contribute to it each year. As an individual, you're limited to $3,500 this year, 2019, that's the, the cap. For a married couple, you double the number, so it's $7,000 is the, the max. You can even do a little bit of a sweetener uh, once you reach age 55 as a catch-up contribution. But the point is, it's not an unlimited amount of money that you can contribute. That same limitation, that same cap, applies to this obscure rule that we're referring to now. If you are going to move money from a traditional IRA over to your health savings account, you're still limited by the same dollar amount that the, the government capped you on your contributions. Which brings me to the second trap. And this almost 
that little obscure rule almost begs you to fall into this trap. When you transfer that IRA money to that HSA, that's not deductible. And you might say, well, you know, duh, Mike, I thought you were the nerd on the show. I know because you never pay tax on that IRA money and then you transfer it over to the HSA. But because the limit on this transfer is based on the contribution limit, you might just instinctively think, yeah, put some money in this HSA. It lined up with the contribution limit, deducted on my return. No, you, you can't double deduct. There. That's right. Because you already got a tax benefit when you put the money into the traditional IRA and the government's not going to give you another deduction on the same money. And so the limit is still the limit for what goes into your HSA. So if your employer happens to be generous and is donating and putting, donating, you're earning that money, sorry, uh, putting that money, some money into your HSA for you, you can't then move the full maximum from your IRA to your HSA, the total amount from your employer that came out of your cash flow as well, and from your IRA cannot exceed those limits that Josh talked about. There's one other big trap, or what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, uh, yet another limitation to this, I think, is where you were about to, to tease out. Josh confessed to me uh, before the show that he's not a fan of this I know. I, strategy. My, my bad attitude on this rule is coming out, <laughs> I, isn't I, I, can, I can just I can, feel it. I can feel it, too. I, I don't want to be critical of Congress, because I'm sure they've got really hard jobs, but good grief. This is a this is a dumb rule. This This part right here. Yeah. You only get to do this one time during your lifetime. One calendar year, you get this opportunity. I feel like, boy, this this is a great tool, a great potential for a rule. And then they tuck this little nugget in that says you only get to do it one time. And to me, it just it takes away so much of the goodness, the potential here. Why not let people do this every single year? Because when you move money from a traditional IRA to a health savings account, it is for the purpose of using it for medical expenses, medical expenses during your working career or even into retirement as well. Mm -hmm. If you use it for something else, they make you pay a 20% penalty on the growth. So it's already got teeth. And, you know, this isn't a rule that should be um, ripe for being abused or anything. Why not give people the ability to do it every single year? I, I feel like they, they had a good idea going and then they just came up short on this one. Well, that doesn't sound like Congress at all. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, this is it's important that people know that this option is out there. It is a little bit cumbersome. And you say, well, this is a simple and easy thing to do. No, on the complexity scale, this is uh, probably a seven or an eight. Um, there's not really anything simple, but for the right person in the right situation, this could make a lot of sense. I think if you want to rant about something wrong, rant about the idea that your doctor can't tell you what anything costs. Yeah, good point. That's what, that's what you should be upset about because you're saying, well, I'm going to be setting aside this money to prepare for my medical expenses when I go to my doctor and say, hey, so what does this cost? They can't tell you. They won't tell you. And so there, there are actually a lot of things that need to be fixed. It seems uh, like uh, fixing Congress. May <laughs> That's where we should start. <laughs> no. But, 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 the, but the idea here, despite Josh's attitude, um, <laughs> there's an idea here where you can transition money from an IRA to an HSA and it's maybe you're still viewing that as retirement money. I'll, I'll spend this money in retirement. But when it's in the HSA, you can pull that money out in retirement on qualified medical expenses, even if you don't have an HSA um, plan or a high deductible health plan at that time. You'll be on Medicare. Well, in retirement, what can you use your HSA for? Now, these rules are pretty crazy as well. Any normal qualified medical expense... But you can also use your HSA to help with long-term care insurance premiums up to a certain amount and also Medicare premiums, but not Medicare supplements. That doesn't make any sense to me. But you can reimburse yourself for some, uh, if you happen to be paying Part A, most likely for Part B. You can pull that out of your HSA. To me, it's only a matter of time until they let you do the supplement because I don't understand why that's separate anyway. But you could... It, 
the question is, are you going to have qualified medical expenses in retirement? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you pull that money out of an IRA, you're going to pay tax on it. If you pull that money out of an HSA, it'll be tax-free. So that's why we talk about the HSA being such a powerful and versatile planning tool and why we bring up this very obscure rule. So, And the other thing, just to, just to throw this in there, here's a, a little goodie. If you have medical expenses that you don't use your HSA money to cover, save those receipts. Keep, it, keep track of those receipts because at some point in the future, you can use those receipts to offset uh, withdrawals from your HSA. Mm-hmm. All right, let's start diving into, okay, now that we know how the HSA works, who's eligible and when they're eligible and how it all works, now that we know that you can do this obscure rule, transferring money from an IRA to an HSA, one time up to the limit, okay, one time in your lifetime up to the limit, when would you do it? What circumstances would you do it? And I'll throw out the first one. Um, Say you know that you've got a, you've been, you, you have a medical diagnosis and you know you're going to be having some out-of-pocket medical expenses. And maybe because of that, that's rendered cash flow to be a little bit tighter. Maybe you're working less or you're, you're now disabled and you need to be transitioning into, into retirement. This is sort of happening fast. And you don't have the cash flow to fund your HSA, but you've got IRA dollars. I mean, this is, this is sort of the perfect scenario for this. You don't have the cash flow to go to put into your HSA, but you've got a high deductible health plan and you know you've got a lot of upcoming medical expenses. You can transfer. I would, in that situation, I would make this transfer from your IRA and I'd use your once in a lifetime coupon to make this transfer to then pull money from your IRA directly into your HSA. Same scenario I would have thought of as well. It's a crisis management type of opportunity here. Yep. There's a couple other scenarios that you might want to consider doing this, but then there's several where, hey, don't do it. Know that it's possible, but I wouldn't do it in that situation. We've got that and more coming up here on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. So okay. We're going into number three. Going into number three. Real quick. Um, Does that feel very satisfying? That this this topic is spilling. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I just it's just to it's, register. It's, a you win. guys were right. <laughs> it's going. It's just. It's going quickly. It feels like it's going quickly here. Um, is there? I can think of one other scenario that's. <clears throat> I mean, close to that one, but would apply to more people. When you'd want to do this. Kevin, what we what we really noodled on during case class is both over age fifty five, mm-hmm. both having this HSA plan mm-hmm. and opening up separate HSAs, and one person doing it one year, one person doing it next year. Well, you could do that. Couldn't you do it in the family plan though? Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. I mean, and it, but it's per individual that can do this. Both having transfer. HSAs. Not both having separate high deductible health plans, but you need to have separate HSA separate yeah. HSA accounts. You I mean, can't have a family HSA. You can have a family high deductible health plan, but you have to have separate HSA bank accounts. Is my understanding? Yeah. You see? No. Yeah, because an HSA is tied to the the spouse who has the health insurance. So in your case, it's tied to you, not to you and Lori. Because a health savings account, like an IRA, is an individual account. Other people can be authorized to use it, though. This, this is just funky. It is funky. Yeah, it's it's a family health insurance plan, but I think the HSA itself is created by one person. Yep. That's my understanding. Well, yeah, That's for sure. Too. I mean, the, so the HSA limits are going to go from seven to seventy one hundred in two thousand twenty. Okay. And do we know that? Has that been announced? Or is it are we speculating? Shoot, baby. So and the it, it's go it goes from thirty five hundred to thirty five fifty in two thousand twenty. Okay. Hmm. I liked when they were nice round numbers for this year. Yeah, this can, year it was a hundred and fifty dollar jump from mm-hmm. for families, but it's only gonna be a hundred. Did you see what the four one K limits are doing? No. They're going it's it, it's going Another five hundred each. Nice. 
So, so that's an increase. Your ca- so 19.5 and then catch up of 6,500. Mm-hmm. Nice. That's a $26,000. 26. That's nice. Pocket to Shove, okay. shovel some cash into. All right, let's get into it. Third segment. When should you transfer some money from your IRA into your HSA, and when should you not do that? That's what we're talking about right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being with us. My name's Mike Bernard. Here with me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Thank you to Bethel University Adult and Graduate Studies, as well as Diane Bennett and the Inspired Homes team for making the Wise Money Show possible. Thank you very much. If you aren't a fan of the YouTube channel, I would check it out. You'd see us right now all wearing the same shirt. How embarrassing is that? But still, go to the YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search the Wise Money Show. Every episode of the Wise Money Show is posted there every single week. You can leave comments. You can you can give a thumbs up. You can share And then also we've got additional videos and contents that come out throughout the month that you don't want to miss. So check us out there on YouTube. Just search The Wise Money Show. All right. there We're talking about situations when you might want to exercise your once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to transition a little bit of money from your IRA to your HSA. And the first we talked about, well, you've got a bad health diagnosis. You're going to need to take some money out. You don't have the cash flow to contribute to your HSA. Just transfer some from your IRA over. What about in retirement planning? So we talk all the time about the need to do comprehensive financial planning. That's really look at your at all of your financial decisions through how do they impact all six areas of your financial life. If you're in the home stretch here and you've got retirement, you've got it marked on the calendar on your iPhone or something because you're not circling dates on actual calendars anymore. But um, but it's it's right there. You're on the horizon and you've got cash flow. You could put the money into your HSA and contribute to your HSA. But if you've looked at your overall plan and you've said, well, I don't know, you know, this is, I'm going to be retiring this year. So it's not going to be a big tax year. I don't really need, need the deduction. And what we actually need, need is maybe to get money in a Roth or build up cash for this certain expense or, or something like that. And cash should be earmarked for something else. But it's your last year before you retire. This might be the last opportunity you have to get money into that HSA. Then I would consider transferring some of your IRA to your HSA. Okay, but you might be stumbling onto one of the other potential traps, right? Mm-hmm. Because you said in the last year right before you retire. But one of the gotchas that they built into this rule are that you have to remain eligible for an HSA for 12 months after you do this little maneuver. My goodness. Yes, so you're right. If if at age 65 you go sign up for Medicare and that sparks a, a moment in time where you are no longer eligible for HSA, if that happened inside of 12 months from you doing this transfer from IRA to to health savings account, then you're going to be penalized on that money that you transferred. Yeah. So in my mind, this creates, for all the same reasons that you just hit, Mike, think of this um, for getting ready for, uh, for retirement. I think there's kind of this narrow window of ages where it's most practical. And it's from age 55 to 64, let's say. And at age 55, with a health savings account, you are now eligible to contribute more than ever before to a, a family um, plan. If, if you have family coverage, it's a $7,000 maximum this year in 2019. But if you're over age 55, you get an extra 1000 We said in an earlier segment that you only get to do this maneuver one time during your lifetime, so you may as well make it count, right? And so it's after age 55 that you can do the most money possible. Mm-hmm. And, but don't get so close to your retirement date that you actually disqualify yourself because you're inside of 12 months. Yep, great point. When else would you not want to do this or would you want to be very careful about doing it? And to me, to me the obvious one is if you routinely, if you routinely have the cash flow and you're funding your HSA. If you are funding your HSA, get that tax deduction You've got the ability to contribute X amount into your HSA each and every year. If you transfer it from your IRA to your HSA, it doesn't help you on your taxes. It might help you in the future when you pull the money out. 
but it doesn't help you create a deduction today. So if you've got cash flow and you're contributing to your HSA, I, I would I would hesitate to to exercise this option. Get the tax deduction on your contribution. Yeah, and to further simplify, there are th- <laughs> there are three ways to get money into your HSA. One is to move it from your IRA to your HSA, which we've been talking about. Another is you just write a check to your HSA. Another way to do it is via payroll deduction, and there are some tax savings that are realized if you do it that way. And the, again, for every gimme, there's a gotcha. Uh, not everyone is eligible to contribute to their HSA via payroll. Right. Yep. So, but make sure this is a this is a huge tax planning opportunity. So make sure when you're working and doing your tax planning and you you have various choices as far as where do you put your money or how do you move your money to gain a tax advantage or to gain tax favor and make sure you're aware of all of those and then if you've got finite resources make sure you're properly prioritizing those so that the right things happen at the right time that's right I think the last scenario I would tell you, and we've already sort of said this, but I'm going to say it again. Last scenario where you would not want to exercise this option is if your employer is contributing a significant amount to your HSA, because that just limits the amount that you're, I mean, you're already limited as to how many times in your lifetime you can do this, how much you can do in a certain year. And if your employer is is funding some of your HSA for you, then your limit is even less on how much of this you can do. And um, so it just makes the strategy a little bit, you know, that much more less impactful on your overall financial situation. So if you're doing this, uh, you know, it almost goes without saying, but I'm going to say it. If you're doing this or considering this or think this might be an option for you, you've got to be doing comprehensive financial planning. You can't look at this one idea and say, yep, this makes sense. I should do this. You've got to look at it from all areas of your financial life. You want me to prove it? When Josh said you can transfer pre-tax money that you'd otherwise take out and pay tax on, you could transfer it to your HSA and pull it out tax-free, I was sold, (laughs) right? So if you just look at it from that vacuum, you'd say, well, no brainer, of course. Now, you need to be doing comprehensive financial planning to make sure this idea really fits in your entire financial life. All right, we're going to transition to questions from fan of the, fans of the show. First one is from a fan of the show, Linda. This is sort of a follow-up to last week's episode. And she asked, at what ages, she's 71 from Granger, by the way, at what age should you pick out burial plots and do pre-planning for funeral expenses? I, I don't know that I have an age in mind on this one, yeah. to, to be honest with you. Do you even you. recommend it? I, I never really have. Yeah. To to be honest, I, I I talk to a lot of clients about it, and it feels important to a lot of people because they they don't want a lot of hassle left behind, right? And and I understand that. I mean, if you could make the process um, go smoothly, I, I was talking to a client uh, just a few days ago. She wants to go prepay um, for all of her uh, final expenses and everything because she wants to make sure that she's cremated and that it's a really uh, basically no service. Like she doesn't want a bunch of fuss. Mm. And she's afraid that if it's left to her two sons, they'll make a big deal about things and spend more money than is necessary and, and so on. But for her, the question that I was posing was, all right, you know, you could prepay some of these expenses, but right now it's still early enough in retirement that, um, you know, her her retirement is funded well, but not a lot of room for error. Okay, not a lot of fluff. We we don't necessarily anticipate there being a big inheritance left behind when when she's uh, gone from this world, and so to prepay some expenses now that she may need access to to help fund her retirement feels premature in her particular case. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I shared with her that, boy, if if you want the kids to not go too extravagant on any um, uh, of the final planning or anything, have them pay for it out of the inheritance that's being left behind because now they have a financial incentive to be a little bit more frugal. Yeah, the trick with that is, is that people can say, well, this inheritance, I never had the money in the first place. So. True. 
I'm going to get the $15,000 copper uh, casket. Mm-hmm. I mean, I saw it. It is, a, it is a work of art. It's like something you'd want to have in your living room. <laughs> so, uh, except not. There's so I do want to talk about. I, I, so, Josh, you you don't talk to clients much about it. I I've started to talk more and more about it. So, want to hit that question. A great question from Mark about the four percent rule in retirement. That and more coming up here on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. All right, let's pick it back up. So, do you have a specific age you're going to point to? No. No. I actually am going to say the exact same thing you said. No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Except way no. better. <laughs> no. No, no, no. I, I do. Um, well, bonus content on YouTube, except hopefully I get to share it, but in case it sparks some ideas from you guys. Um, the decision-making is more important than the prepaying, in my opinion. Most people, there are, if they've done planning, there are the resources to pay. It's really not. I, I, I think from a planning perspective, it's not that. It's the decision making. And I think I think family members who are dealing are grieving a loved one who's lo- who's been who's passed like that decisions are more streamlined. And I think the person who is aging likes the peace of mind when they've made those decisions up front. So to me, I tell people. If you're thinking about it before age 70, that's too early. I mean, so at least it seems like you, no one knows when they're going to pass, but it seems like you get into your 70s a little bit, maybe 75 or so before you start worrying about it. Or if you're really worried, if it's keeping you up at night. Yeah, or if you have a health diagnosis where you know that statistically you are closer to the end than many of your peers. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I get that. YouTube, forgive me if you hear that exact same thing here in one minute. (laughs) Just pretend like it's the first time you've heard it. All right. Fourth segment, Land of the Plane. We'll finish this one, and we'll get to Mark's 4% rule, and my guess is that will probably take the whole segment. That's That's a good question. Thanks for being with us. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name's Mike Bernard. Here with me in the KFG studios, Josh Gregory and Kevin Corhorn. If you've missed anything on today's program and you love podcasts, you'll find The Wise Money Show there wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search The Wise Money Show, subscribe to it so that you are up to date and and a new podcast every single week for The Wise Money Show gets sent right to you. And then I'd also ask you to rate the show and leave comments right there as well. That helps other people find the Wise Money Show as they're looking for uh, material on wise financial principles. So thank you very much. We are in the portion of the show where we're taking questions from fans of the show. Linda 71 from Granger. Hey, what age should we pick out burial plots and prepay our funeral? Here's my perspective. For most people that are doing planning, and this might not be most people in general, but for most people that are doing planning, it's not Prepaying is not as big of a deal because usually there are resources, ten to fifteen thousand dollars of resources that are left within the estate that can pay for the funeral if it wasn't prepaid. It's the pre-planning that I think helps, and I think it helps both sides. When you're a family member who's just lost a loved one, you're grieving, it's emotional, a lot of things need to happen at one time. When some decisions are made in advance and you know that they're that person's wishes, it just typically feels better and easier in a very bad time, okay? And then if you're the individual that's in the later stages of your life, pre making some of those decisions early often brings you peace of mind as well. So I think the pre-planning has a lot of value. The pre-paying, maybe not so much, but I think it goes hand in hand. If you're going to pre-plan, you got to pre-pay, and it might make sense. Now, at what age do you do that? Obviously, if you have a health diagnosis, then you'll plan accordingly. But to me, I often tell people, you got to get into your 70s. No one knows how long you'll live. But, I mean, if you're going to make it to your 90s, you don't want a decision made three decades earlier to be obsolete and say, no, that's not my intention at all anymore. So you got to get into retirement a little bit. And so I'd say, well, get into your 70s a bit. So 75 or so. Or 
if it's keeping you up at night. If you're really, really worried about it, then just take care of it. Yeah, I mean, when you look at so prepay and pre-plan, I, I don't know what pre-plan actually means. I, I would just go <laughs> I would just go with plan. plan so <laughs> and if you be, and the reason why is if you have certain wishes, let your family know, look, this is what I want to happen. When I when I'm up out of here, when I leave this earth, but I mean it's possible, like you said, Mike, if you got thirty years left, you you end up married to someone else for the last twenty five. Right. So who knows what the future holds? Um, so I I but I do like the idea of communicating with your family and saying, hey, listen, I want to be, you know, married. I want to be married. I want to be buried at the you know Smith Cemetery right down the road here, and this is where I want to be. I would think about it um, where my mom is buried. It, the, it's not on the way to anything. So I think I've only seen her grave site two or three times in the last 22 years. And so I, if you can find some real estate that is, it's got some good visibility or easy to swing by, I might consider that uh, <laughs> just out of consideration for the ones left behind. Kevin Corhorn, I've never heard that. You need to be considerate and make it convenient. Yes. Wow, I've never heard Make it, it convenient for the ones you're leaving behind. <laughs> All right. I don't know. I, that's not wise money sanctioned advice. Though. That's just coming from Kevin. <laughs> just coming from Kevin there. All right. Well, I love this next question here. Mark is 66 from Mishawaka, and he's obviously thinking about retirement. Here's what he asked. Do you agree with the 4% withdrawal rule in retirement? Ooh, as a nerd, I love it, but... For those of you non-nerds, for those of you that are just pretty cool listening, what in the world's the four percent rule? <laughs> well, so this is the academic world's um, attempt to try to um, calculate what is a safe percentage of withdrawal from your retirement accounts, so that you don't run out of money in retirement. They're they're trying to create a rule of thumb where, especially in this area, we say rules of thumb will fail you every time. Right. A retirement, a safe retirement um, is one that's based on pr- plenty of pre-planning, as Kevin likes to say, <laughs> um, getting <laughs> getting ready <What>? for <laughs> getting ready for retirement, saving the right amount and so on. But then knowing uh, running forecasts to determine what's a sustainable amount for you to live off of in retirement. This four percent rule was uh, a, a way to try to. Um, basically give a blanket statement to everybody. Well, it wasn't just made up, though. You know, it was based on a lot of research and a lot of Definitely. trials. And But it was a lot of trials based off of the past. That's right. And different rolling time periods. Well, if you had this, if you had your investments invested this way and you perfectly performed what those investments performed and you withdrew X percentage over this time period, you would have run out. Over this time period, you wouldn't have and so on. And all those trials led to, well, 4% should be sustainable. And 4% is not a bad idea when the 10-year Treasury note is at 6%. That That's where you say, hey, that's really doable to get dividends and interest off my bond portfolio. But when the 10-year bond is at, is at 1.75%, I'm... I'm actually dipping into principle. The idea is, can my can my investment portfolio kick off four percent and not dip into principle, or or can my total return for my investments do six to eight percent on average? And I pull out four, so there's a little growth in the early years of retirement. And as inflation starts making that four percent, four and a half, and four point seven five, and five, and five point two, and so on that I've got a bigger portfolio that can sustain that as I start dipping into principal in the later years of my life. But Kevin, you're right. I mean, this is all based on um, history and that that normal. And now we're in what many people are saying is a new normal with perpetually low interest rates is what people are expecting. Well, and that's one of the reasons why these same academics have gone back and amended some of their studies. I remember being in an audience when uh, the original researcher was speaking, and um, he he was actually explaining the 4% rule, and he explained it differently than every practitioner I've ever listened to explain it. Uh, You know, we we tend to think that he meant 
just look at your account balance each year and pull 4% out that year. And that is not what he meant. Right. Um, he, he actually meant the very first year that you retire, you set 4% as your withdrawal amount, and then you adjust that for inflation over time. That's right. So it's really only 4% year one. Right. Now he's saying something closer to 3.5% is more sustainable for, for most people. And again, it's all dependent upon the particular mix of investments that his research was testing as well. And also what then your experience will be with those investments, because the Dalbar study suggests that your experience might not be that of the actual investments. And it depends on what your preference is, because some people say, listen, I want to spend money, but I don't want to touch the principal. And some people say, hey, I'm fine having a blend of income and principal. And when I get toward, when I get when I go from go-go to slow-go to no-go years, if I don't have that much money left, I'm totally fine with that. So let's now answer the question. We've been talking around it. Or, or do we agree with the 4% withdrawal rule? What I agree with, Mark, is comprehensive financial planning and building a retirement projection based on your entire financial life, but based on five key factors of retirement. I mean, that's, that's what tells you whether or what your sustainable withdrawal rate is. That's exactly right. You know, the the one time, I'm going to confess this to you, the one time that I cite the 4% rule, which is maybe really the 3.5% rule, is when I know a client is, they've started spending at a pace that they cannot sustain. You know, maybe they're pulling 8 or 9% out each year, and it really needs to come down. I use this as a metric to give them context. Yeah. Yep, I, but it's no excuse for planning. It's no substitute it's substitute for planning, is, is better said. I mean, there's five factors that go into your retirement. Your nest egg, the size of your investments, that's just one of those factors. And I would argue it's not the most important one. They're all important, but it's not the most important one. So great question, Mark. We'll probably hit more, maybe even a whole episode on that show. But that's all we have uh, time for today. On behalf of Kevin Corhorn, Josh Gregory, Myself and everyone at KFG, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group, KFG Wealth Management, LLC, and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.